Since the 1950s, state leaders have focused on luring more and more people to Florida as the key to our economic future. Growth, they said, was the road to prosperity, and building roads made growth happen. Every new highway helped turn more farms and forests into houses and shopping malls. They called it development, but it was really half a century of doing the same thing, of trusting that growth any and all growth, and growth alone, meant progress and improvement. 1950-style development has produced more problems than solutions for Florida. Yet our transportation planners are still stuck on the old developer's highway when we should be changing lanes. For 50 years, Florida's official policy from the governor on down has been to let the growth industry drive Florida's economy. And what did we get for it? Compared to the rest of the country, wages and household incomes here are lower now than they were 10 years ago. Property taxes and traffic are both higher. Crime and high school dropout rates are the second worst in the nation. So what are we doing about it? Mostly building more roads to nowhere that land speculators soon fill up with residential sprawl, costing more in public services than it generates in taxes. Residential growth can't even pay for itself, much less add to our economy, but Florida's government still wants more of it. When they couldn't get it with taxes, they started issuing bonds. So tomorrow's taxpayers could pay for today's construction projects on the installment plan. For highways in the form of tolls. Florida's original toll road, the so-called main line between I-75 and Miami, was the Florida Turnpike. How its financing was supposed to work is explained in this Florida Development Commission film. Revenue from tolls and rentals are applied to liquidate this indebtedness, and after the bonds are retired, the state of Florida takes title to the project. It sounds simple enough, but when the Florida Turnpike was finally paid off in the 1980s, tolls actually went up because the Turnpike District wanted money to build more roads. State law is supposed to limit how much South Florida motorists pay to support toll roads in other places but almost 80% of turnpike revenues come from the main line alone. After six years of operation, the Veterans Expressway in Tampa was only earning about half its projected income. The Polk Parkway just over a third. Why would anyone go to such lengths to build expensive roads that are grossly underused? The most often cited reason is to relieve traffic congestion. But the facts no longer support that 1950s idea. Walter Kulash is a much quoted traffic engineer whose clients have included private developers as well as state and local governments. We are convinced that we not only cannot build our way out of road congestion, but that attempting to do so will make the congestion even worse. And the reason is that that the demand for road capacity, travel demand, traffic demand, uh, has an element of induced demand that almost no other service or municipal product has. Our travel forecasting models don't pick that up. Our travel forecasting models say everybody's going to stay right where they are and the businesses are going to stay right where they are and that's how travel is going to happen. Our ability to exploit new road capacity 
uh, with induced traffic gets better and better. Uh, for example, the big box industry, the big box retail industry gets better and better at get drawing people from larger travel areas to ever larger big boxes because we are providing the road capacity. So they're eliminating whole intermediate steps of warehousing and travel on their part because the public is providing a road system that people can get to their destinations at 60 miles an hour. This kind of induced activity, it's unique to traffic. Doesn't happen with other municipal services. For example, if we increase the size of our wastewater treatment plant, used to be called sewer plants, increase the size of that, you know, people don't use the bathroom more. They, that's a fixed amount, and so building a bigger capacity works. When we build more roads, uh, yes, people move faster for a little while, but then what happens? They start moving farther, and they start moving much more, and so we quickly find that we have uh, not solved the congestion problem. We have spread congestion, the same amount of congestion, over even a greater area. There's some serious research on this now. Well, one of the leading places, for example, is the University of California at Berkeley, and they've come up with a uh, with a, an aggregate statistic that confirms what a lot of people just know from what they see on the street, which is that within five years after the completion of major new capacity, typically meaning freeways or widening of freeways, within five years, slightly over 90% of that capacity is totally consumed with new induced traffic that we had no idea was going to be there. Even. Things are not always what they seem. The sun may look like it revolves around the earth, just as building roads may look like a traffic solution. But neither idea is true. Florida is only the 22nd of our states in area, but it's the fourth largest in population. That disparity means we're already putting people into environmentally sensitive areas. These yellow areas are the areas of maximum recharge for the Floridan aquifer, the main source of water for the entire state. We can't afford to pave over these places as we've done all around them. Yet Florida's newest toll road, the Suncoast Parkway, is intended to generate new growth in this critical region. The veterans combined with the Suncoast Parkway 1 and then eventually, if it's built at Suncoast Parkway 2, will represent an 80-mile transportation corridor, uh, which will be a major benefit to this region of the state. This can open up the center of the county for economic development, so I think it's going to be a boost to Pasco County. The Suncoast Parkway can only be a major benefit to this region of the state if new growth generates enough problems on existing roads to make people willing to pay for driving it. Right now, it's so far from being a transportation improvement that they have to advertise for users. This road is a good example of everything that has gone wrong with development in the Sunshine State. From an environmental perspective, it's a road that should never have been built. When the state started planning it, they first looked for money from the federal government. That required an environmental impact study. The Federal Highway Administration decided that the environmentally preferred alternative was not to build the road. The Turnpike District issued bonds and built it anyway. So Olga Blanco now has Project 1 of the Suncoast Toll Road in her backyard. I lived in Tampa all my life and we started our dairy business in 1949. In 1958, the um, airport uh, had to take that property so we started looking further north and uh, we figured that uh, we wouldn't be bothered anymore for my lifetime I wouldn't have to uh, move again but Suncoast Parkway was going to come right through our property now I find myself that I am behind a six foot tall fence I hate to see it but I have to deal with it especially my house is, is full of memories and we built it ourselves and uh, it might be dangerous for me to stay up front here. When uh, we moved here, we had to drive three miles to Gun and 54 to pick up our mail. I even read my own electric meter uh, on, and they would come and check me once a year or twice a year. When I used to do my dishes, I would look out my kitchen window that faces uh, 54 and oh, in 10 minutes that I'd be doing dishes, uh, maybe one or two cars would go by. 
there wouldn't be any problem with people coming in, trespassing, because we each uh, took care of our place. Growth is, of course, coming in. And um, between the um, Sun Coast to my uh, west and 41 to um, the east, uh, there is a figure of about 10,000 homes that are going to be built. Building roads makes growth happen, but is growth, or at least more of this kind of growth, what Florida needs? Well-documented national studies consistently show that residential growth is a tax drain. Commercial land use brings in taxes, but it almost always generates more residential growth, too. The real winner is actually open land, which saves big money just by not requiring expensive streets and services. The numbers are even more impressive in Florida. A 1996 Soil and Water Conservation District study for Lake County showed residential development cost $1.56 for every tax dollar generated, and farmland cost only seven cents. Stretching from Hillsborough County to northern Hernando, the Suncoast Parkway will provide a quick link from rural hamlets to downtown Tampa. Fortune 500 companies aren't tempted to come here because of an easier commute to downtown Tampa. What they're looking for are places which have a high quality of life, including scenic beauty, convenient recreation opportunities, and good schools. Increasingly, that's not Florida today. The original development concept was quite different. To build the industrial potential of our state upon the natural advantages of a healthful climate and pleasant living conditions for the skilled workmen in our growing labor force. It sounded great. All we really did, though, was build more houses and widen roads to make room for more people. Instead of skilled workers, we got lowly service jobs. And our pleasant living conditions, time after time, became ugly and inefficient suburban sprawl. To most people, this stretch of Florida's Gulf Coast qualifies as very pleasant living conditions. Often called the Nature Coast, it's the wildest coastline left in Florida, and one of the longest natural coastlines left in all America. The study area for Project 2 of the Sun Coast Parkway is right in the middle of the Nature Coast. The state has already spent millions of tax dollars here purchasing conservation lands to connect federally protected national wildlife refuges on the coast with state protected forest to the east. Any route through this corridor would upset years of conservation planning and ruin projects taxpayers have already paid big money for. Half of all the bird species of the United States can be found in Florida. We have some of the most unique plants and animals in the world. Eight percent of them found nowhere else. Some of Florida's unique plants and animals need to live in special places. That's part of what makes them unique, and that's what makes them so valuable as barometers for what's happening to Florida's overall environment. The Florida scrub jay, named for its special habitat, has declined to 10 percent of its original numbers because of habitat loss. The red cockaded woodpecker is on the federal list of endangered species because it requires old trees for nesting. These trees have been almost eliminated by early harvest lumbering and by accelerated commercial and residential growth. The woodpeckers nest in hollow cavities which take a couple of years to make. Even then, they can only use longleaf or slash pine trees old enough to have developed a fungus that softens the wood at the center of the trees. If we want to keep our threatened and endangered species, we need to protect the places they need to live, places like the Lakanto Sandhills and the Withlacoochee State Forest. Under natural conditions, these places were shaped and maintained by fire. Florida gets more lightning strikes than almost any other part of the country. So plants like the saw palmetto evolved underground stems and rapidly growing leaves as adaptations to regularly occurring fires. 
Other plants, like longleaf pines, actually require burning in order for their seeds to germinate. Controlled fire is the most important tool land managers have to maintain or recreate natural systems. As land manager Kevin Love, who works for the Southwest Florida Water Management District, explains. We have basically gotten in the way of the natural processes that have shaped Florida, the landscape of Florida, the habitats of Florida. The more that we box our natural areas in with roads, especially roads, you know, limited access uh, toll roads like the Suncoast Parkway, the more it restricts land managers' ability to apply fire to those natural areas, which is essential. On conservation lands especially, we need to somehow try to mimic or replace those natural processes that can no longer work as they did. Any burning done to the west of the, the Sun Coast Parkway alignment is going to blow smoke across the road, and you cannot do that. What land managers are forced to do then is to limit the number of days per year that they do burning. It's more costly to do burning. The ultimate the result of that is going to be just a diminishment of the quality and the function of our, of our conservation lands. Highways like the Sun Coast and the growth they bring with them are also real physical barriers that eliminate or greatly reduce movement of species across habitat corridors. What's at stake here are not just a few large or endangered plants and animals, but whole natural communities which also need smaller, less noticeable plants and animals in order to function. To save a species, we need to save its community. To save a community, we need to save a piece of the landscape of which it is a part. Connected habitat corridors are the last chance we have of saving Florida's hard-pressed natural systems. University of Kentucky wildlife biologist Josh Brown recently completed the last year of a five-year study of the region's black bears. The ideal uh, way to preserve this type of habitat would be to connect it to some other bear population in Florida. Problem with that is probably the closest bear habitat is Ocala National Forest, which is probably uh, anywhere from 90 to 100 miles away. So we have to move across several different types of landscapes, and that's where roads come into play. That's where habitat fragmentation comes into play. Because the real key for the longevity for the Chazowitzka bear is land acquisition. 2001 was actually the highest year on record for road kills uh, for bears in the state of Florida. You're losing almost 10% of your bears a year uh, simply to road kill. And the bear has to move across all of these different habitats to find food seasonally at different times of the year. Uh, animals inevitably have to cross a road in order to survive. And when we put a wildlife underpass in play, it's important to put it in an intelligent location, one that's going to be used. North of the city of Brooksville, uh, you'll see two wildlife underpasses that don't exactly do their ideal function. One goes from a patch of habitat over to a current uh, mine. This is not a good underpass. <laughs> you're going from a patch of habitat to a mine where at varying times of the day you're going to see dump trucks, uh, cranes, maybe even dynamite. Uh, no animal's going to use this. Suncoast Project 1 officials claimed they worked closely with the biologists. We've jumped through every hoop imaginable to get to where we are right now. Uh, we've got wildlife crossings all up and down. We've got eight total wildlife crossings that we've put into this, this project and fencing to keep the animals from getting on the road. They're only going to be able to cross at the wildlife crossings. And those are crossings that were established, set up by the different agencies we work with. The biologists, however, say otherwise. And in building or the construction of the Suncoast uh, Phase 1, they actually consulted my professor at the University of Kentucky, Dave Mayer. And Dave gave them suggestions where he thought legitimate or sufficient wildlife underpasses should be put in place on the, the Phase 1 of the Suncoast Toll Road. For some reason, unbeknownst to me, uh, DOT or whoever was involved there pretty much put Dave and uh, the other biologists' opinions off to the side and put these underpasses in what seemed like the most convenient place for them. The Turnpike District often chose which facts it wanted to believe. The Veterans Expressway, Seminole Parkway, Polk Parkway, and Osceola Parkway were all justified using traffic projections by the same consulting company that were wildly inaccurate. 
Revenues for the Suncoast Parkway also turned out to be below what was supposedly required by state law to justify building it. Initially, consultants projected that in the first year it would make $70 million in toll revenue. Through the years, the projections have decreased by $56 million. By law, the parkway is required to show through its feasibility study that in the first five years, the roadway will be able to pay at least 50% of its debt service back to its bondholders. According to court records, a financial expert with DOT testified in 1998 that that meant the project would not be feasible if toll revenue dropped below the five-year projection of $138 million, which it does. The most recent projections indicate that the project is miscalculated by almost $37 million. DOT says the excess money will have to come through tolls collected from other Florida turnpikes or... We would ask the local district, the local DOT district, or the counties, can you make up that shortfall? As usual, it's taxpayers who have to pay for these convenient mistakes, and current residents who have to sacrifice their backyards and neighborhoods so developers can keep making money bringing in more people. Fifty years ago, our economy, population, and lifestyles were very different from what they are today. Back then, the original interstate highway system filled an obvious existing need. It connected America's cities to each other. Now, roads like the Suncoast Parkway are being put into rural areas to create a need. The bond prospectus for the Suncoast describes this plan for potential investors. The impact of land use lag, it says, is greater in the early years of project operation with development building to or near expected levels over time. It goes on to cheerfully point out how the toll road will get used more and more as congestion on all other roads in the area comes up to expectations. The growth industry, of course, already knows this. Within months of the Suncoast Parkway's opening, they provided a bus tour of the new business opportunities so generously opened up by the toll road. Planning for congestion is almost nobody's idea of progress and improvement. Yet many people who ought to know better still accept this kind of road building as good for our future. The Sierra Club is fighting progress in hopes of protecting the Bay Area's environment. The news media often report on the problems of growth, but rarely seem to understand that pushing development at any cost is a big part of those problems. Now, the Department of Transportation maintains it actually got a bargain by paying $9 million for the property that was valued at $7 million because they say with damages it would far have exceeded that. However, critics say that's just not true. The comparable properties were selling for less. And the department also maintains it did not choose the site for this road before the public hearings, even though the court records indicate that it did. Instead of learning from its well-publicized mistakes, the Turnpike District changed its name and seems intent on removing public accountability of any sort. DOT has declared war on the environment here. Lawyer Leslie Blackner explains how the laws have been changed. Environmental feasibility is pretty much whatever the Turnpike District wants it, wants it to be. And the Turnpike District has never found a road that is not environmentally feasible. I personally learned a very important and hard lesson during the 2002 legislative session. Many of the Florida Turnpike toll roads built in the last 10, 12 years are not paying for themselves in the time period set forth by the legislature in the Turnpike Authorization Statute. I was hopeful that there would be a demand for accountability and there would be some reform of the Turnpike District. Incredibly, not only has Turnpike not been asked to account for what has happened, the legislature just rewrites the laws to accommodate Turnpike's unlawful behavior. So instead of having a road that must pay for 50 percent of its cost in the first five years of operation, now the Turnpike District has 12 years to pay off the first 
50% of the bond indebtedness or the cost of the road. And it has 22 years, not 15 years. It has 22 years to pay off the full cost of the road. A practically unstoppable, self-governing, and self-financing road-building monster. No wonder critics refer to the newly redesigned Turnpike Enterprise as Roadzilla. They make a valid point. If these roads are so unquestionably good for Florida's future, why can't the road builders meet public standards for good business practices and provide reasonable accountability for public debt? Our state and local representatives, all too often, want to have their cake and eat it too. They talk conservation, but when it comes down to taking action, they're still fixated on the old growth machine as the goose that lays golden eggs. Somewhere, we have to start saying enough is enough. Somewhere, we have to start saying that the needs of people who already live here are just as important as the needs of people who want to live here. For all their mistakes, the road builders are right about one thing, though. Roads do make growth happen. But is it the kind of growth, and in the kind of places, to really benefit our communities? Now I have this uh, mountain next to me, which is the Sun Coast, and I can't see my sunset. So if I want to see the sunset, I have to drive maybe uh, a mile further north on my property so that I can appreciate it. And uh, I was aggravated, so I wrote the song, My Sunset. Each day I sat on my front porch so I could see the sunset behind the trees. But now I can't see the sunset anymore cause the Sun Coast Parkway popped up next door. Now I have to drive, drive, drive north on my old country road so that I can see that sunset behind the trees.